the reason I think that shamanism is so important is because I think what it really boils down to is a revaluing of personal identity. And that when you strip away the feathers and the chants and all the anthropological uh, gimcrackery that goes along with it, what makes it so compelling and so attractive is that it is a more authentic state of being somehow. Now why? It seems to me that the reason why is because uh, theories about the world are based on direct experience. The shaman is a kind of provisional scientist making it up as he or she goes along, constantly willing to revise and keep it open-ended. And information imported from without is extremely suspicious, which is the exact opposite of the way science, for example, does its work. In science, if you ha have a bizarre result or a peculiar finding, you immediately say, well, go check the literature. See if anyone else ever got this before. Then get them on the phone, and we'll see if we can't duplicate what they were doing. Uh, what this creates is what we have, which is uh, a vast, low-grade, inductively derived image of reality, where only those things which happen with the greatest regularity and the greatest predictability are authenticated by our languages. So we can talk about rain and sunrise and mealtime and obligation because these things are repetitiously before us to the point where they have become known as smooth stones are known. But what is not repetitiously before us is the edge of cognition, the unique part of our own felt experience of reality. And the reason for this is very deeply rooted in the culture. It's that we believe in these bizarre notions like consensus, like uniformity of phenomena, predictability, probability. I mean, everyone here believes in probability. Who here could explain it to the satisfaction of anyone? I mean, we are adrift and embedded in a matrix of unexamined linguistic excuses for avoiding looking at how weird it is. And that is what the shaman is not. The shaman, first of all, basically has no real history, cannot consult vast libraries, is not in touch with the reputations, the overwhelming, stuffy reputations of his antecedents hundreds of years in the past. The, the shaman can usually ask one guy or one woman older than himself. And that elder represents the, what for us would be an entire epigenetic cosmos of data banks, libraries, hieroglyphic records, museum drawers crammed with artifactoria, so forth and so on. So the shaman's intellectual horizon in terms of what we call historicity is very foreshortened. Consequently, everything has to be explained out of energy that is unleashed in the psyche, energy of speculation, of myth-making, of imagination. And this is, in fact, then what the function becomes and what the shamans are doing. They are not consuming culture. They are generating it. And herein lies the point for us. We must generate culture rather than consume it to the degree that we take this ideal upon ourselves. 
what people say, you know, is it enough to just clean up your diet? I mean, how can we react in an in a ever more stultifying political environment? And I'm very loath to try and deeply answer that because uh, I don't trust myself. I don't know what I'm talking about. But it does seem to me that uh, the great weapon is art because uh, art is confusing. Art hides a multitude of sins and can serve many masters at once. It is subversive. It is cheap to produce. And if we take seriously the notion that society is an environment, an ideological jungle of competing memes, then it's reasonable to suppose that the most articulately and clearly constructed myths will in fact come to be. That he who, he who can tell the best story or she who can tell the best story will see that story come to be. This is what uh, the shamans are doing for their societies. They are exemplars. And this is a point that I want to make very clearly because uh, I was published in the LA uh, press as knocking the venerable habit of using quartz crystals. <laughs> so I want to talk uh, for a moment about the shaman as prestidigitator, the shaman as showbiz, and point out that really what, what shamans understand is that the world is not as it appears. And this is big news everywhere. <laughs> no culture is entirely comfortable with the news that it's living in a fool's paradise. But in the, in the tribal situation, where sometimes living groups number under 100, and people are living in, let's say, an extreme environment like the highland savannas of Central Asia or the Amazon jungle, there is a social cohesiveness that brooks no illusions about what people are. I mean, it's pretty funky. But out of it comes the exemplar, the exceptional individual, what we call, I believe, intellectuals. And the intellectual is alienated and sees more deeply into things than everybody else, because everybody else is just running around inside the cultural form. And it's very easy to run around inside the cultural form and never to question it, regardless of what it is. But the, what in Western society is institutionalized as a vast edifice of edge work, personified originally in the idea of the universities and then later in the idea of the scientific and, and avant-garde artistic community, this, this institution that empowers the exploration of the unknown in these tribal societies is boiled down to just one uh, dude or one woman. And that person's job is to push the envelope, to push the cultural envelope, and to come back and report on strange things, and to confound the political leaders, and, and to control the weather, and ensure good hunting, and work miraculous oh, cures, and make everyone feel good about themselves, and through the production of poetry, dance, mask making, chanting, to give permission for cultural evolution, to empower experiment, to invite people to journey into the cultural self-image. So, so the, the shamans are really, in a way, micro-vectors for movement into the future. They are the anticipators. <laughs>